enjoy my righteousness and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you, and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn. All surpassing gift of righteousness. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my
Hello and welcome to worship. It's really good to have you with us today. We hope that you find in this service something that resonates with you and where you are at the moment. We thanks to all the team who've put this service together behind the scenes and in front of the camera. And we do so in order that you might feel God with you wherever you are this morning. Hopefully things are moving towards a slow uh, move out of such a strict lockdown, but wherever you are, may you feel really blessed today and know that God is with you just as surely as if we were meeting together in our buildings and we hope it won't be long before we're doing that on a regular basis. But meanwhile, sit back and worship God with us. Take my place 
that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be set free Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me who brings our cave
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. to 35 Jesus and the Prince of Demons One time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat When his family heard what was happening they tried to take him away He's out of his mind they said But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? He asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. The True Family of Jesus then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come and talk to them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus and someone said, Your mother and brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look. These are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. 
Hi everybody, good to be back with you again and uh, oh, what a reading. Um, yeah, we don't tend to notice how radical and controversial Jesus was. I think we approach him with um, familiarity because probably most of you went to Sunday school and you heard the stories then and you've grown up with it and you have an idea in your head about what Jesus was like and it's really hard to to change those views but when we look at that we can see the sort of unsettling quality that Jesus had about him um his his sort of <laughs> nobody's favorite at this point in the story and it, it, his ministry's only just started but he's already making waves and, and causing trouble um, because he's not going along with everybody else the most respected members of society including his own family um, he's yeah perhaps we miss the shock of this we think oh this is Jesus this can't possibly be that shocking but the things that are happening in this reading are shocking and they're meant to be shocking it's meant to stop us in our tracks and make us um, take stock and look, look again at what's happening so let's just first of all those of us who've got families who are um, shall we say interesting interesting families those of us with interesting families will no doubt be uh, thrilled to know that family dynamics even in Jesus family could um, be potentially um, problematic so um, we, we can see that reflected in the story but the the, the first uh, issue that we have is Jesus tackling the religious elite um, he's gone from almost in the blink of an eye from anonymity in Nazareth and Capernaum to drawing crowds to him the ordinary people just seem to get it straight away they understand because Jesus isn't waiting for them to come to him he's going out to them and he doesn't approach them with preconceived ideas he's he's open to actually really observing their reality and understanding them and then meeting their very real needs and they love him for it who wouldn't you know you've been on the scrap heap for years feeling like you're of no significance and I'm sure many of us have felt like that at times in our lives in comes Jesus and makes them feel special like there's possibility in their lives and wow, how transforming that can be when, when we come across that. And, and you'd think that the, of all places within uh, the synagogues, within the temple, the religious structure in Judaism would think, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. And of all things, I mean, they don't just say, oh, you're misguided here. They're actually so threatened by what he's doing that they come at him with the most incredible accusation. So we've got to think, what, what is it that he's actually doing that's so unsettling for them? He's, he's challenging everything that they've done in the past. Now, in our churches, very little has changed for not just decades but centuries I often feel if um, John Wesley were to come back and walk into our churches he would be very very familiar with what was happening the tunes many of the hymns would be the same that he recognized in his life um, the way that the music is played the layout of the chapels, everything is identical to what it was in the 1700s. And yet, we know how hugely life has changed since then. And as a church, we've not always reflected that because church has been our safe place and we all need that. We all need somewhere that isn't always 
threatening and unsettling like Jesus was. We, we like that comfort and familiarity and because that's what we grew up with. That's what we remember from our childhoods. And in a world that's vastly changing, it's natural that we want things to, consider, to continue to be the same as we remember them. And yet, I think if this pandemic has taught us one thing, it's that things can't carry on exactly as they were. That, now, that might sound a bit scandalous, but I believe it's completely true that as a church, we are there to serve the present age, as the hymn goes. Um, and to serve this age, we need to be speaking in ways that are relevant to our society and looking at the very real issues and debates that are being had on the world stage and adding our voice to it. Now, as Jesus came along and started talking to the ordinary people and often the ones who um, the religious people didn't want to mix with because they weren't considered good enough. Um, they devoted so much of their life and energy to training and to fulfilling the letter of the law and to being righteous people. But they wanted a reward for that. They didn't want riffraff coming in and spoiling it all and cheapening it. You know, people who, who, who well, not very educated, pretty rough people, not always living their lives very well. Some who had illnesses and such like that made them unclean. They wanted to keep themselves pure. But as a result, they were cutting themselves off from the very people that God had a heart for those who were considered outsiders. And this was such a threat, what Jesus was doing, as well as because he spoke with such power and authority, and it was obvious that he was filled with this powerful spirit. Instead of welcoming that, their response, well, the devil's in him actually accusing him of being in league with the devil. Now, whether Jesus was a perfect man or not, we don't know. But the examples that we have of his ministry are undeniably wonderful and wholesome and fulfilling and uplifting all the things, all the good things that we want in life. And they're calling him the devil. Now, today we don't tend to think of that in um, society. We don't tend to think of good and evil as being personified. But if we go back to the Middle Ages, people definitely did see that the devil at the forces of evil as being quite personal. And this is something that we can sort of see in this in this reading as well. That very um, I don't want to say primitive view, but uh, a very simplistic view. And and I would fall into that. I um, I don't see you know the little devil with his horns and his cute little red suit and little uh, forked tail. But there have been the most incredible times in my life when I have felt under attack and I can only say that there was some malevolent force that was determined to stop me in my tracks. The first time I really noticed it was when I um, started candidating for the ministry and it was like no holes barred. I felt I should have the words kick here sort of written in uh, diamonds across my teeth you know because being criticized for doing something different and that's what i was at that time i was different to the um, established members of the church who 
were doing things as had always been done. I'd come in from a basically a non-church background with all these fresh ideas and things that I wanted the church to be an exciting and creative and energising place and it, it wasn't. Um, and instead of the, those people getting to know me and trying to channel that in, in a good way, it was immediate like this. No, we're not having this. This is, this is wrong. There's something wrong with you. You are threatening us. What's wrong with what we've always been doing? Well, nothing, but it's only pleasing you. It's not meeting a wider need. Nobody knew was going to come in because it's, it's just doesn't relate to their experience of life. So the, the, um, the Pharisees who'd been concentrating on the finer points of uh, the faith and the rules and the regulations were, were actually being challenged to think bigger, that the kingdom of God just is big enough for everybody and all people are welcome within it. And for them, that was unsettling. You know, they, they no longer knew where they were in the hierarchy, which is like up here. Suddenly that the folk down here were of equal value. No, that can't be right, surely. No, no, come on, get a grip. So get his family, he's, he's lost his mind. Come and get him, take him home. So the, the family come along to, um, take Jesus, you know, who's, who's had a, an episode, to come and, and take him home and try and calm him down and diffuse the situation. And Jesus says at the end of that passage, who are my mother and my brothers? Anyone who does the will of God is my mother or my brother. We're family. Now, I don't know whether you've um, watched the Long Lost Family programme on the television. It's um, just come back again. But this time they are looking at uh, babies that have been abandoned and helping them to find their family, which we can now do through DNA. And having been adopted myself, I, it just never even crossed my mind that my mum and dad didn't actually look like me. In fact, I only thought about it this year um it didn't really matter but when i went over to australia and met my biological family it was really weird to look at people and see reflections of my own face in theirs not identical by any means but it really particularly my biological mother i would look at her and i went whoa what's that yeah you know, it was so odd but to feel like you belong because these are your people so when we become part of jesus family what what is it what is that commonality we told that it's being spirit filled that is that thing that that binds us all together so let's just think if, if we're actually being called to family what what is a good family like because maybe we can all <laughs> look at our family mind <laughs> full of nuts as you could probably guess um what is it if we you know, belong to a really good family what values would that show to us well it would be a place where we could be ourselves you know, if you go out somewhere and you're mixing with, uh, say, aristocracy or somebody, you think, oh, I've got to be on my best behaviour, hope I don't let the side down, all the rest of it. Then you get back home and think, oh, yeah, it won't matter if I put the milk in first or second when I'm making a cup of tea, you know, where, where the cream is on my scone won't matter, but I say scone or scone won't matter. You're back at home and you know you can just relax and be yourself. And in God's family, that should be the case. Nobody should come to our church and feel they have to be anything other than themselves. But we are encouraged in a good family to be our very best selves, as Barack Obama would say. Encourage us to not give way to our baser nature, not to be antagonistic or demanding, but 
to be gracious and to value each other and to fulfill our potential but not at the expense of others that we we do it together and that's the thing i love about being here in york there's such a, a team spirit in the churches that i want us to really carry forward we we also all of us have weaknesses i've got areas in my life that i struggle with and other things that i'm really good at things that i can do and do well and i know i can use those skills but i don't have to pretend to be perfect we shouldn't think oh if i say oh, i say i'm having doubts about my faith i don't quite understand about the things of god I, well who does we're all on a learning curve. We all have periods of great strength and certainty and other times when the bedrock of our life moves from underneath us. Doesn't matter, that's what being a family is. You can do that. You can be vulnerable and still be supported and loved. And finally, what is so important about being part of a family is that we're given a name and names particularly at the time of jesus were hugely significant it formed your identity both your uh given name i suppose it wouldn't be christian name would it um pre-jesus so our names like abby helen um which means light uh think of the uh, native americans who came up with these incredible names for their children and uh swift eagle and these sort of of lovely things because it, you know something happened around the birth so those names which get, almost give you a mission to fulfill you know how can i be light for you guys today how can i live my life radiating something of god but also we have our family names which give us that identity so that i know that now I am a child of God and that means I belong that this is who I am it's who you are and we're all in it together and it, it's as we are the church together we have to move forwards and adapt just as Jesus did the courage of this man <laughs> from the word go to tackle these people with all this uh, education and learning which you know I, I just love show me someone who's passionate um, about learning and I just love it but we're going to do it together this is the sort of church that we want to be a church that still shows these qualities that Jesus brought to his community so in that way unchanging and yet adapting doing things in a way which really will have an impact on the lives of those that come into our buildings and those that don't so there's our challenge we're following this guy folks this one that's um disturbing and confrontational and dares to suggest that we do things slightly differently you know heaven forbid should we rearrange the chairs in church there are some people for whom that is ooh, too much but we're on this together so let's remember that let's over this coming week support each other be encouraging let's help each other to really fulfill our potential and in doing that we're going to glorify god so Praise to the Lord. I raise a hallelujah.
your presence, God. Lord, in today's Bible reading we find you surrounded by people, just as you are today. They were so hungry to hear, to be fed, they stopped your meal. 
We recognise their need to engage with what you have to say and no doubt ask questions. We all still have that need. Our daily bread. Come to each of us now. Be with each of us now. Give us our daily bread. Food for the body. Food for the soul. As we are fed, we bring you our concerns, perhaps for ourselves or our family situations, for others personally known or unknown to us, for people in power and authority, and for the future of the world. Like us today, I'm sure they looked for things to change for the better. To change the world, first change yourself. Help me to change myself and to be led by you. Amen. Lord, in today's Bible reading we find you surrounded by people who have made up their minds about you. It's just the same today. Some people then didn't like what you said because you, Lord, didn't agree with them. It's the same today. They said you were possessed by Satan and naturally we humans are so sure that our opinions are correct that we can't be wrong. Can we? Remind me again, who is Lord? Forgive me for all the times I have expected you to think like me. Forgive me for all those times when I have decided I am right and you, God, agree with me. Lead me, Lord. Give me the courage to face my beliefs as well as my fears and doubts. Help me not to be static in my thinking, but to mature, develop, change. Amen. In today's Bible reading, you give strong guidance about the Holy Spirit. Lord, you gave your Holy Spirit to us. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Give each of us these gifts and the grace to allow the fruits of the Spirit to flourish in our lives so that we may be a blessing in the lives of others. Amen. In today's Bible reading we read that your earthly family, mother and brothers, came to see you. Lord, we also discover that you expanded the definition of family. We know what families are like. We know families bring joy and happiness, but they also bring their challenges. We also better realise, because of the Covid pandemic, that we need each other more than we recognise or acknowledge that we did before the pandemic. You tell us we all have brothers from other mothers and sisters from other misters. So enable each of us to face the future, holding on to the Holy Spirit's guidance and seeking to develop those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Teach us how to share these gifts with our one human family, each and every human soul because they, we, are all part of your kingdom family here on earth. You, Lord, told us the way we treat the least of our family members is the way we treat you. Let us live and be family, doing it your way. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving Creator, we honour you and we honour all that you have made. Renew the world in the image of your perfect love. Give us what we need today and a hunger to see the whole world fed. Strengthen us for what lies ahead. Heal us from the hurts of the past and give us courage to follow your call in this moment. For your love is the only power, the only home, the only honour we need in this world and in the world to come. Amen.
I hope you've enjoyed our service today. Thank you to everybody who's taken part and all of you who've joined us online. I hope you have a really lovely week. Let's just finish with a blessing. The deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you deep peace of the shining stars to you, the deep peace of the Son of Peace to you. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I Now you call me a citizen of heaven. Where